SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Our topic today is from Notley to Nenshi. That kind of sums it up. I don't really have to say any more. There were, this is the topic of conversation right now, as long as you're not, you know, a federal political watcher, <laughs> which hopefully you're not, because it's, it's depressing and devastating. We've got 30 minutes for Dwayne to give his presentation. And then we're going to do a Q&A. If you do not want to get up and speak into the microphone for the question and answer, you can bring a written, named question over to me. I'm sitting right here. I should be done my chicken club by then. Don't worry about it anyway. <laughs> uh, you can view this session on, and I have to actually look at this because it changes once in a while, Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs website, sacpod.ca, our YouTube channel, and on the Rogers TV community channel. It's worth watching again. There's always something you miss. Every time I go back and listen to or watch another uh, a session that I've been the moderator at, there's two or three things that I miss. It's well worth watching. Our presenter today is Dwayne Bratt. He is a professor at Mount Royal University in Calgary. He has been to SACPA many times. He's a wonderful speaker. His discussions are always well organized. Recently, he's done a couple of, uh, he's been involved with the publication of a couple of really good books. One is Orange Chinook, Politics, Politics in the New Alberta, which was when the red wave swept through the province. Orange. Or Orange, sorry. There'll be no red wave. Uh, and then the most recent one is Blue Storm, The Rise and Fall of Jason Kenney. That's actually a pretty good one, too. I mean, that was, man, that was, those were the days, huh? His next one will be like Deep Blue Apocalypse or something, I'm sure, but <laughs> let's cross that bridge when we get to it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to talk to us about the changes in the NDP leadership with the incredible rise and victory of Naid Nenshi, here is Dwayne Bratt, Mount Royal University. Well, thank you for that introduction, and I can say that we are in the early days of planning for Volume 3 um, on the Smith government. Uh, what we need to figure out is a title um, of a color and a weather pattern. Um, and so if any suggestions uh, are welcome. Uh, I say this at many events, and I've heard some really creative ideas. Um, so please, uh, please feel free to, to volunteer. Uh, that because uh, we tend to work backwards from the election um, uh, for publication dates, so uh, aiming for um, February of 2027, except we've been given a six-month uh, extension, uh, apparently. Um, so uh, um, we'll, we'll see about uh, we'll see about that. Uh, the other is, and I don't normally do this, but I, uh, I deliberately um, dressed myself this morning for this event. So you'll notice, for those at the back, a purple shirt with an orange tie, <laughs> which I think fits quite nicely with the theme of uh, Notley uh, to uh, Nenshi. Okay. And I don't normally have slides, but there were some numbers uh, that I needed to put in there, so I thought this was uh, valuable, and I thought, well, if I'm gonna put some numbers in there, I should put some pictures in there. And so as part of the theme, there is uh, Notley to uh, Nenshi. And there is no way that Nahed Nenshi would be leader of the NDP without what Rachel Notley did to the party. Um, so this idea that she has moderated centrist, turned it into a, um, a competitive party, we're now in a two-party system, um, let's just say Nenshi would not have run in 2014 for the NDP. So we started with six, okay? Uh, and the first indication that um, this was going to be a big Nenshi victory was when Raki Pencelli drops out after a week 
uh, of Nechi in there. So we go to four. And what she said was she saw the numbers, the membership sales after a week and realized she had no chance and nobody had a chance. So she made the smart decision, pull out quickly, endorse Nenshi, and now she is deputy leader of the, the party and she, uh, anyone who has met her looks at that and, and she is a star. And I see her as a future NDP leader, just not now. Uh, she's got a lot of smarts and a lot of uh, charisma. Uh, Gil McGowan also ran briefly, uh, pulled out. I think um, Gil kind of overestimated how much support he would have. He could not raise the money uh, and, and he has uh, walked away. Uh, and then the others were Sarah Hoffman, who is probably as close to Notley as anyone, has the deepest roots in the NDP party, tried to play that role um, and just got subsumed. Uh, Kathleen Ganley, it would have been a very interesting race uh, for Ganley if Nahed had not entered uh, because I, I think there was a clear desire for a non-Edmonton leader, for a Calgary leader and once then she came in he became the Calgary candidate and Ganley was uh, was not. Uh, and Jody uh, Callahoe Stonehouse, I think people run for leadership all, for all sorts of different reasons. She has dramatically increased her profile within the party and I think that was uh, an important role that she played as well as increasing knowledge around indigenous issues uh, within the NDP. Uh, I don't think there was any expectation she was going to win but that's not why she ran and so I think she had a very successful candidacy. So this is just what I'm trying to say is the comparison between the um, NDP in 2014 and the NDP of 2024. So in 2014 when Notley ran and Graham Thompson, the former Edmonton Journal columnist who still does commentary for a bunch of different outlets, used to talk about how the NDP typically chose their leaders. It would be a room about a quarter of the size of this. They would be sitting around a table and it would be, no, you do it. No, no, you do it. Um, that's, and, and that wasn't that much off uh, in 2014. It was a $5,000 entry fee. They only had four MLAs and they had actually doubled their caucus uh, in 2012. Previous to that, they had two um, and uh, they had 3,500 members. So, okay, maybe a bit more than a quarter of the size of this room. But flash forward 10 years and the entry fee goes from 5,000 to 60,000. That means it's a serious leadership race. Uh, it's still less than what the uh, UCP was in 2022, which was over 100,000, but still substantial sum of money. Um, not four MLAs, 38 MLAs, the largest opposition in Alberta history, and slightly more than 3,500 members, <laughs> 85,000 uh, members. And uh, I'm not sure how well you, you see this, but this, I think, is a remarkable graph um, of where the membership sales came from. And there is twice as many NDP members in the city of Calgary than in Edmonton. Uh, and I don't think anyone would have predicted that prior to uh, Nenshi's ar arrival. Um, he did enter the race late, but let's just say there was a lot of movement and organization going on behind the scenes prior to his formal announcement. Um, I don't think they were selling memberships because they couldn't sell memberships, but they were identifying people to buy memberships. And then the moment that they pressed go, they went to that list and bang, 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 bang. So much so that it led Racky Pancello to, to drop out. And then I think this is significant. Uh, and that is the 29% 
of NDP members outside the city of Calgary and the city of Edmonton. Um, so I was listening, uh, it was a nice drive from Calgary this morning, I was listening to the Curse of Politics and they were talking about rural Alberta and what Nancy's chances are of rural Alberta and of course they, they scoffed at that and I would scoff at that. But the other is not rural Alberta, it is Lethbridge, it is Red Deer, it is Airdrie, it is St. Albert. It is Sherwood Park, and that's where um, the UCP won the election, and the NDP lost, in, in my book, uh, was not in Calgary and Edmonton. It was in the small cities and in the suburbs. So here are the results, and there are two very remarkable things that we need to put in there. Obviously, the percentage. This was not a nail-biter. Uh, this was a domination. Uh, but the other is how little slippage there was. Okay? So go back here. You're going to have to do the math in your head, unfortunately. 85,000 members and roughly 75,000 voted. That's a very small slippage, much bigger slippage in 2022 in the UCP race, much bigger slippage in most leadership races. People buy memberships for all sorts of reasons that they may not have any intention of voting. In some cases, in party leadership races, memberships are bought for you. You may be even unaware that you've bought one. Um, but you still have to be the person to show up to vote. So the fact that they had over 75,000 people voting in in what was widely anticipated to be a first ballot victory for Nenshi, I think is, is remarkable. And I think the NDP should be thanking Nenshi for coming into the race. And this is why I say that. Imagine he doesn't come in, okay? And Kathleen Ganley or Sarah Hoffman are the next NDP leader, and there is 15 to 20,000 people who voted. Okay, that it does not augur well for them going into a general election. 85,000, that does. That, that shows a large degree of support. Rachel Notley, in the days just before the balloting, I think it was Thursday or Friday, gave a very weird interview with Don Braid. I'm not sure how much coverage this got outside of Calgary, where she was a bit critical of Nenshi um, in his plans to uh, divorce from the federal NDP, but also by saying he didn't really bring in a lot of people into the NDP, that these were already supporters of the NDP. And I agree. I, if, you, if you look at those 75,000 or 85,000, those are all people who voted for the NDP in 2023. I don't think there was anyone who voted for the UCP in 2023 who then bought an NDP membership card. And so what he has done is consolidate those NDP supporters who are core NDP, they're ex-liberals, they're ex-PCs. We are now in a two-party system. I know it's still weird in Alberta to have two powerful parties with a, a party on the right and a party on the left, right? And so the party on the right is the non-NDP vote, the non-progressive vote, and the party on the left is the non a uh, conservative vote. It's, it's quite simple, and, and we see this in Saskatchewan, we see this in Manitoba, it, we see this in BC. Now, BC likes to change who that party on the right is. It used to be the Social uh, Credit Party, then it became the BC Liberals, now it looks like it's going to be the BC Conservatives, so they're going through a bit of an inflection point, but it's still, at the end of this election in BC, there'll be a party on the left and a party on the, on the right, and that's what we have here as opposed to successive one-party systems. And that's really what, what Notley brought to the table, and that's what led a man like Nenshi to come in. So here are some comparisons, okay? So in 2006, the PCs, back in those one-party dominance, they, they actually had 144,000 people vote. Uh, because if you were to influence the government, this was your one shot at doing this. So there were a lot of people who bought PC memberships in 2006 that were not members of the PC party. I probably had never voted for the PC party. And you could buy them two minutes before you voted as opposed to six weeks. Um, Ed Stelmack on his first ballot got less than 15,000 votes. 
Okay, and on his second ballot, he got 51,000, uh, but then when you had the ranked ballot system, that put him up to 77,000. Okay. As I said, Notley uh, won with 70%, so uh, less percentage than Nenshi in 2024, and slightly fewer votes, uh, 2,500 compared to uh, 65,000. Okay. And then I think the best comparison is not either of those two, it's the UCP. So again, we're in two separate we're in a two-party system. Both parties have leadership races roughly within two years of each other. Daniel Smith uh, got 35,000 votes on the first ballot and 42,000 on the, on the second. Um, she has done a remarkable job at, at unifying that caucus. This was an incredibly divided party uh, in the summer of 2022. They had just pushed out a sitting premier, uh, and it took six ballots before Smith defeated Travis Taves. Uh, the fact that they have remained as united, uh, I think, speaks to Smith's caucus abilities. I don't know if it was the paintball tournament a week after. Uh, I don't think that hurt. I, just can't imagine Jason Kenney uh, playing paintball with his caucus, uh, and Smith did. Uh, I talked to a UCP MLA backbencher uh, in the fall of 2022, and he said, I have had more one-on-one -on -one chats with Daniel Smith in six weeks than I did with Jason Kenney in three years. Um, and so she had to do that because it was such a divided party. And then she doesn't have that. When you get 86% of the vote on the first ballot, you don't have a divided party. Uh, you have your party. Okay. So why did Nenshi win? Um, I find this fascinating to compare the mayoral race of 2010 in Calgary with the uh, leadership race of the NDP in 2024. In 2010, Nenshi was largely unknown. Uh, yeah, he wrote an irregular column in the Herald on municipal politics. He was a commentator. Um, he was a professor at Mount Royal. I, I worked with Nahed. We actually designed a course together and taught together. Um, so uh, when, when people say, you know, I like Nahed, uh, but the longer he was mayor, the more arrogant he got. Having known him prior to becoming mayor, there was a lot of that already. He, a lot of self-confidence, which you need in politics, okay? So in 2010, he was Mr. Policy Wonk. He had massive streams of, of policy on every topic, went to these small little coffee meetings uh, in houses, um, spoke in paragraphs and complete sentences, and it was all about policy. 2024, there is no policy uh, unless you say the policy is win. It was all about winability. It was all, I'm a three-term premier or three-term mayor of Calgary. Um, this is a city we need to win. I've won it three times. I've beaten conservatives. I beat Rick McIver in 2010. I beat Bill Smith in, in 2017. I've beaten conservatives. I have very high name recognition, and not just in Toronto, uh, but in all of Alberta. And my guess is, um, I can speak for Kathleen Ganley, more people in Calgary knew who Nancy was than Ganley, even though Ganley had been justice minister. And my guess is probably more in Edmonton knew who Nancy was than Sarah Hoffman. Um, there's probably only a handful handful of politicians in this country that if you if they came to your door you would know who they are. Uh, Trudeau, Polyev, Smith, Nenshi, Notley, um, and so that that was his whole campaign. It wasn't about policy, it was we can win. Um, and in fact the NDP opened the door for Nenshi to win. I will say in, in confidence I had uh, some conversations uh, with Nenshi prior to him entering the race. Um, and uh, there was a clause in the leadership rules about how you had to be a member of the party as of such and such a date. But then they also said, or if you represent the values of the NDP. And uh, he referred to that as the Nenshi clause. 
again, did I mention self-confidence being important? Um, so there was a lot of various back and forth on that, but there were also some comments about what does social democracy mean, because that was seen as one of the values uh, of the NDP and, and various other things. Um, he was very deliberate in uh, how he rolled this out, but by by not coming out soon, by waiting, what it allowed for was this anticipation and this groundswell. And, and poor Kathleen Ganley, she has a really great launch. She's standing there with a whole bunch of MLAs who are endorsing her, like Irfan Sabir, like Shannon Phillips. And the first question is, what about Nietzsche? Okay, uh, I think that was that was an indication. So there was this whisper campaign that was louder than a whisper until he finally rolled itself out, uh, and so there was a lot of anticipation about that. So I think that is really how he uh, how he won, and he was able to marshal the Purple Army. Um, that he had assembled in 2010, in 2013, in 2017, as well as the NDP. So it's not a coincidence that Zane Velji, who is involved in the mayor races with Nenshi, was also involved in the NDP campaign in 2023. And they were able to put those two, orange and purple, together uh, for, his, uh, for his victory. Nenshi versus Smith. This will be fascinating. Danielle Smith is an incredible political communicator. She, she really is. Um, if you meet her in small groups or one-on-one, -on -one, is incredibly charming. I've, I've known both of these people for, for a long period of time. But there's all, and, and then she, he can talk. Um, and you also have a situation where they've known each other for over 30 years, they went to school together, they hung out together, uh, they know the various nerves to hit on each other. And I'm just going to give a small anecdote that I think represents what life was like versus what life is about to become. So just after Smith becomes Wild Rose leader. This is in 2009. And then she hosts a talk for her at Mount Royal. Okay? Now, university campuses are not usually receptive to conservatives. Um, that's just the way life works. Uh, those uh, young people are very idealistic, very progressive. Uh, then they get families and mortgages and become very conservative. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so Nancy organizes this. She does fairly well in a hostile environment. And then the three of us go for coffee for about an hour and a half afterwards. I can't imagine that occurring today. Um, and uh, especially no one was interrupting us. You can imagine if the three of us sat at, at, at Tim Hortons, uh, there might be an audience. Um, when Nenshi, so back in the winter, Daniel Smith rolled out uh, um, an announcement around uh, trans children. Now the regulations on that, the legislation on that, that's not going to come out until November. Um, but there was a lot of backlash by some groups to that, that statement, and there was a large rally that was held in Calgary days after. And Nenshi was a high-profile speaker, and he gave really what was a campaign speech, uh, and talked about how personally disappointed he was in, in Daniel Smith's uh, TV address. And so, um, as I said, there's a lot of history there, and that means for uh, some really interesting politics when it, when it hits. He does have challenges. Challenge number one is a seat in the legislature. This is not as big an issue as it was for Daniel Smith, because when she became leader, she became premier. She had to get a seat in the legislature. The case of Nancy, he doesn't necessarily need to get in there quickly. Um, there's no rush, there, there's no demand. He can sit back and, and watch for a while. After all, the next election isn't until the fall of 2027. <laughs> But at a certain point, he will go, okay? Then the question is where? He is not going to run in Lethbridge. I'm, I'm sorry to, to say that. Um, and um, it, it's interesting, some of the, uh, not, not the UCP government, but UCP supporters 
are you know calling him now a coward and he's afraid to run and all of this completely ignoring how Daniel Smith didn't run in an open seat in Calgary Elbow and instead encouraged someone to leave in Brooks Medicine Hat. Um, so he's not going to run in Lethbridge. I also don't expect um, Rachel Notley to stay in the legislature much longer. Um, Edmonton Strathcona is the safest uh, NDP riding in all of Alberta. Uh, Notley won it narrowly with about 85% of the vote in 2023, but Nancy's not going to run in, in Edmonton Strathcona either. I expect a seat in Calgary. My money, my shiny loony is on Calgary Buffalo where Joe CC is. Um, Joe was recruited into the party in, in 2015 and I remember chatting with Joe afterwards and he goes, yeah, they told me if, if I ran, um, I could finish second. If I didn't run, the NDP would finish third in the riding, and I woke up and I had won. Uh, but he then moved because of some boundary changes to Calgary Buffalo, which is the most safest seat in, in uh, Alberta. It used to be a liberal seat. The liberal, provincial liberal, sorry, Bridget, don't actually exist much anymore. Uh, but they've all moved to the NDP. And he can say, look, it, that's where City Hall is. Right? That was my home for 13 years or 11 years, so he'll be in there. Caucus management, he's never been part of a party before. So this is going to be a challenge for him. Not as significant a challenge as um, it was for Smith because it's a much more unified party. But it's going to be a test of his leadership. He did have a lot of endorsements. Uh, now he's got a great show of support. Let's see how he manages caucus. He's also going to be an opposition leader for a long period of time. It's not a fun job to be the leader of the opposition. Let's see how he handles that. Relationship with the federal NDP, I think he's going to divorce them. Um, they got pounded over the head in 2023. This line about Rachel Notley's boss being Jagmeet Singh was ridiculous. But they would say, see, there's the clause in the Constitution that says that. This does not mean that people won't work with the federal NDP and the provincial NDP. It just removes the official title because there's no official link between the Conservative Party of Canada and the United Conservative Party. But there's a lot of informal links, as there is elsewhere. So I expect in the, the fall, you will see a split. I don't think you'll see a name change. I think you'll just see a split. He's got to come up with some policies. As I said, uh, policy light. You can't just put a policy book that says, I'm going to win. Um, and in particular, he needs some economic policies and he needs some energy and environment policies. Uh, the social policies, those are pretty well ingrained in the NDP. Um, protection of health care, protection of education, that's pretty much ingrained. But what is he going to do about uh, challenging Trudeau over a oil sands uh, emissions cap? What about the renewable policy, the moratorium that, that Smith brought in? What's he going to do about that? Okay, what's going to be their tax policy? Because I can tell you, coming up with a corporate tax increase uh, in the middle of an election campaign did not work well for the NDP. What's his small city suburban strategy? So I think when I spoke here last year, I said that's why they lost. They won 16 seats, 14 seats in Calgary. Had they won 18 seats, they're still on the opposition benches. But they won one seat out of 10 amongst the small cities, and they won one seat out of 10 around the suburbs. Okay, that's two out of 20. What are they going to do? Um, how does he handle the UCP attacks? Okay. They're going to look at his record as mayor. They're going to say there was a carving out of downtown Calgary. Okay. Uh, they blame the carving out of downtown Calgary on Notley. They blamed it on Trudeau. Now they'll blame it on Nenshi as opposed to the drop in the price of oil in 2014. But how is he going to handle that? There is, I'm happy to be in Lethbridge because I can have water. Um, but already there are members of the UCP blaming Nenshi for the water main break. And um, the Oilers lost on Monday. Nenshi was elected on Saturday. I don't think that was a coincidence. <laughs> so how does he handle this? So far, Smith has refrained from doing this. 
um, and the cabinet had until last night when Devin Dreeshen uh, went after Nenshi. So I expect that the attacks will continue. And remember that self-confidence I said? That self-confidence can also delve into lecturing and mansplaining. Uh, and that's a personal weakness that he has. I know uh, some women colleagues that I have talked about mansplaining. I said, look, it. He does that to me too. Uh, so that's why I put the lecturing in there. And so how does he control that? Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. I will say he did a pretty good job of controlling that during the leadership race when he was the only man on stage. Um, but how does he deal with that with Daniel Smith? We'll have to uh, see. Uh, but I will say it will be another fun time in Alberta politics. I believe there's probably a book about this. Uh, and if you've got title ideas, please come and tell me. Uh, but remember, it has to have a color and a weather. Okay? <laughs> and for now, we'll, we'll open up for questions. Thank you. Um, questions will start. You can line up here. We'll step up. We'll ask Dwayne. Um, as always, we ask that during the question you refrain from a personal history and just ask the question. There are probably lots of people with questions. Let's get to all of them. Who's up first? Anyone? There we go. Here she comes. Where's the roving knight? Uh, those, those days are gone. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dwayne. That was very interesting. Uh, my name is Violet Mikma, and I'm wondering if you think that, that this huge wave is going to impact the policies of the UCP party. Will it perhaps make them more moderate so that they won't be losing so many votes from the maybe undecided people? Thank you. I don't think it'll have any impact whatsoever on UCP policies. Uh, I think there's another impact that may affect the UCP, and it's not within the internal workings of the party, and it's not about the NDP. It'll be the next federal election. Uh, because right now, if there was an election held in Alberta, Smith and the UCP win another majority government. Uh, narrowly, but another majority government. And why? Because it's Trudeau. And you can talk about dental care or daycare or renewables or trans or anything like that. Those are all superseded by the fight with Trudeau, who is incredibly unpopular. Uh, just a heads up on that uh, in, this, in this province. But what happens when Trudeau is not there? What happens to your battle with the pensions with um, Pierre Polyev. What happens on uh, all those other issues? I think that's gonna be a much bigger challenge. Ask Jim Prentice how hard it is to run a campaign as a conservative in Alberta when there's a conservative in Ottawa. So um, I think that'll be a bigger challenge. I think Daniel Smith, politically, would love Trudeau to hang around a bit longer. He makes for a good punching bag for her, so. Hi, Ken Sears. Um, what I'd like to talk about, I'd like you to talk about the demographic changes happening in this province. We are seeing, we're, we already are an urban province, yep. but we are seeing that become more and more and more evident, and we're going to have to have a redistricting happening, and I'm not sure of the year, but certainly b right around the time of the next election. Can you talk about how that may impact? So, by demographics, I will bring up two aspects of demographics. A demographic one is that urban-rural uh, divide, and I showed it last time I was here. I could probably show it. I didn't bring it this time, but the best illustration of that divide is the map of Alberta after the 2023 election. So um, the entire city of Edmonton goes NDP, over half of the city of Calgary goes UCP, or goes NDP, and the rest of the province, with the exception of Lethbridge West and Banff Kananaskis, goes uh, UCP. It is striking when you see it in a map. Uh, and I can also say that uh, I've done a series of polls over a number of years with, with Janet Brown looking at value differences. And when we first did it in 2018, there was no value difference. There was a partisan difference, but no value difference between urban Alberta 
and rural Alberta. And, 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 uh, but since COVID, there is a huge value shift. Uh, and I think that is, that is a concern. We'll have to see how the boundaries play itself out. I look at a place like Airdrie. Airdrie has two seats. Airdrie is exploding. I think they're up to about 75,000 people now. Um, and that's just, they will have 100,000 by the time the next election is. But the way that it's divided is it's a bit of Airdrie and a bit of the outlying countryside. And a bit of Airdrie and a bit of the countryside. I think if there was an Airdrie proper riding, that's NDP territory. Um, so it's all going to be about how the boundaries uh, play itself out. So there is that urban-rural divide, and it's becoming more and more urbanized. The question is, what constitutes urban? And it's not just Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, it is Lethbridge. It is Red Deer. It is Airdrie now. It is St. Albert. But the other is around uh, racial differences. And if you look at the map of Calgary and look at where the NDP won seats, that is where the highest amount of visible minorities are. They're currently in Calgary, and I don't know the numbers for Lethbridge, uh, it's over 40%. Uh, but that's not 40% equally divided across the city. Um, you know, uh, Nenshi did this thing uh, with the current during the provincial election um, where he says, uh, it's not 40% in Northeast Calgary, it's 85%, right? It's 90%. And if you look at where the UCP won their seats in the deep south of Calgary, that's the whitest part of Calgary. Um, and so there is a racial demographic shift occurring as well. How is that gonna play itself out? Uh, and that also contributes to some of this urban-rural divide. So we will, uh, we will have to see how that plays itself out. So watch those two demographic factors, because those trends are not going to reverse themselves. They are going to continue. Okay. Hi, Henning Mundell. This morning on CBC, I was listening to uh, Paul McLaughlin, and a uh, uh, commentator, and he, uh, First of all, he thinks that Nancy should run in Lethbridge West, but he also thinks he probably won't. But uh, I want to ask about the other two. Um, the timing of getting, trying to get into the legislature. And uh, he thinks that really, uh, not just that he's not in a hurry, that he might actually drag it out to closer to an election and, therefore number two, spend more of his time in sort of small coffee groups, house group, private groups, knocking on doors for the next while. So your comments on that. I think he would be better spent his time not in the legislature. Um, you're not going to win many votes. You might win some debating points, uh, but that's about it. Uh, you need to get out of Edmonton. You do need to go around this province. Uh, he needs to get out of Calgary. He needs to get out of Edmonton. He needs that, as I said, small city, suburban strategy instead of being tied up. They've got a strong enough opposition. They've got a number of critics. They can hold the feet to the fire of the UCP. And it's not like he can't hold press conferences and comment on the policies of the day of the UCP. He doesn't need to be in the dome. And I think he would augur well. The question is how long, uh, you know, the summer, you know, the, the, the fall, sure. Uh, but the longer he stays out, then that gives a talking point for the UCP to be blasting him about why he's not in there. Um, and he's also got to be careful because the NDP has been very critical of Daniel Smith living in High River, working in Calgary, being the premier in, in Edmonton and having a riding in Brooks Medicine hat that she shows up to very infrequently. And so does he want to replicate that? And I think that was the danger of, of Lethbridge uh, and the danger of, of Edmonton Strathcona. He is a Calgary guy. He needs to run in, in Calgary. I don't think he's in a rush, but if I'm here this time next year and there's no plan to be in the legislature, if he's not in the legislature, I think that's a ticking time bomb for him. So he does need to go in there, not right away. I think he's got some time. 
Uh, he's he's going to enjoy the uh, the barbecue circuit, but there will become a moment where his absence will be noticeable. Great. Before I ask my question, I just want to let folks know there's cake after today's session, so stick around and grab a piece. Uh, my name is Christy Thomas, uh, and I come from a labor background, and uh, the Albert NDP is typically seen as the worker-friendly party, yep. but during the leadership campaign, there was that infamous letter to the Minister of the Day, Labor Minister of the Day, uh, suggesting that maybe collective bargaining agreements could be removed, making jobs easier. And I was just wondering if you can maybe comment your insights on what you think the future of the party looks like uh, in terms of being the worker-friendly party or the party of labor. Okay. I would separate those two. I think you can be a party of workers, I think you can be a party of labor without being the party of the unions. And uh, this is an illustration. So under the NDP constitution, um, that where unions play a role in the party, their votes could be between 0% and 25%. So in the last leadership race, uh, Gil McGowan wouldn't have had to enter, he could have controlled close to 25,000. Well, he'd have had to spend it with Guy Smith and the AUP and the other union leaders, but they could have had 25% of the vote, just like the old British Labour Party did. And one of the um, innovations that Tony Blair did in Britain was to really sever that link between unions and uh, the British Labour Party, the official links. They're still going to be the Workers' Party. Um, I, but the issue with the unions is, is separate. And there's a lot of controversy over that letter. I don't think it worked very well for, for Ganley when she released it. Um, and I think Jeremy Farkas, uh, who's a pretty good conservative, uh, did a real good analysis of that and said, uh, Nenshi was mayor of Calgary. He was directed by council to write that letter. He did that on their behalf. Uh, but it still got his name in there. And they go, well, no, no, no. He actually voted for it at the end. I go, and Farkas goes, yes, he did, but not at the beginning. When he saw where the votes were going, he switched his vote, then wrote the letter. He wrote lots of letters. I, I think uh, Jeremy was only in there one term with him and said there were well over 200 letters that he wrote to the provincial government and other entities on behalf of council. Um, so I think it was an overplayed issue. Um, I'm sure that letter came from the UCP and it was circulated to various camps and Ganley jumped on it and it did not work out well for her. But it may have actually helped Nenshi uh, because it was allowing him on the one hand to say, you know, I was doing this, I was a collaborator with council, I can work well with others, and also kind of say I'm not in the pockets of, of unions. Um, and so that's going to be um, a delicate dance that he's going to have to play that Sarah Hoffman and Rachel Notley could not. Um, you know, Notley as a labor l lawyer, um, you know, um, um, Hoffman with deep roots in the union movement, they could not, Nenshi, uh, Nenshi can, and uh, I think that's a, that's a strength for him. Okay. Hi, my name is Tom Moffat. Thanks for the presentation there, Duane. Um, you mentioned um, economics and energy were going to be areas where Mr. Nancy was going to have to uh, up his game a bit. And so far, both parties seem rather committed to increasing oil and gas in the province and increasing carbon pollution. I don't really see that changing in the future. Um, but at some point, um, the oil and gas economy will start to go down. And um, so my question is, do you think political parties in Alberta will uh, admit that there are other industries in uh, other than oil and gas and that maybe they need some notice or will they just prefer to go down with the ship? <laughs> Let's just say this is another signal that the NDP of today is not the NDP of the past. Um, they used to talk about building refineries uh, in Alberta. Um, then they formed government and they realized why no one had built refineries in Alberta uh, and how expensive it was going to be and they, they abandoned that. 
the ideologues on all sides have been quick to attack Notley for different reasons, but I think it was a pretty pragmatic policy that she had. Uh, supporting of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which would not have been built without Rachel Notley. It's interesting, it is now built, oil is now flowing, and nobody is claiming credit for it. Um, Trudeau was not there when the oil started to flow through. Uh, Notley was not there. Smith was not there. No one was there. It just quietly happened. Uh, so it is an orphan victory. Um, but the other is the most significant element of the Notley years was the climate leadership plan. And there was no doubt about that. That is where she put her political capital. And just a partial uh, plug of Blue Storm, uh, that was the topic of my chapter in there, which was how, with the exception of the consumer-based carbon tax, um, every other element was maintained or enhanced by the Kenny government and was not reversed by the Smith government. So we are now coal-free in this province. Okay? That occurred because of Notley and that occurred because of Kenny and by the time Smith came it was too far down the line not to occur. So um, she said, Notley said 2030, we'll be coal free in 2030. Well my calendar says it's 2024. So six years ahead of schedule. Um, I did have this debate with Andrew Leach at the time. I said, well, all it's going to, you, you talk about 30% renewables, it will not be 30%, it will all be um, natural gas. I proved correct over Andrew, but neither of us could have expected that the provincial government of the day would simply put a moratorium on renewable energy. Um, so the coal phase out has occurred. Uh, I think that it's good for the environment, it's good for air quality, uh, it's also good for the economy. Um, the other was uh, methane reduction. All governments have been working on methane reduction. And I'm really fascinated, I mentioned earlier the emissions cap. There was an emissions cap that was part of the climate leadership plan, and it was in the oil sands only. It was never put into regulations, but it was part of the plan, and that came about through negotiations between the big energy companies and environmental groups. And so when you remember that picture on stage in the fall of 2016, and there's Notley, and there's Phillips, and there's Leach, there's Murray Edwards, Stephen Gee Bowes in that photo because Guy Beau was part of the discussions around an emissions cap for the Alberta oil sands. So where did he get this idea for an emissions cap across the entire oil and gas sector? Um, I think it goes back, uh, goes back there. So uh, I think that's, that's a record that they're not gonna reverse themselves on. There is discussion about the, the, the individual car, the consumer-based carbon tax, but we don't have an individual consumer-based carbon tax in Alberta. We have a federal program. And there is a current federal leader um, who is uh, claiming he will ax the tax. Uh, the, the rest of this stuff he's in there about, you know, uh, build the homes and stop the crime and fix the budget, those are much tougher to do but I expect that that carbon tax at the federal level will be gone days after a Polyev uh, victory. And even in the NDP leadership race, you had people saying, you know, maybe we should think about doing something, uh, something different. Um, there is a clear difference between the UCP's policies and the NDP policies. If you believe that the NDP would have put a moratorium on solar and wind, okay, that would not have happened. But that's something I'm gonna look for, is where is the daylight between the, uh, the UCP and the NDP on that? Because I really don't know where Nenshi is gonna go. And quite frankly, even if he had lost, I'm not sure where they would go on that policy. Because oil and gas isn't just so important uh, to the Alberta economy, it's actually part of our identity uh, to, to many people, where they see attacks on oil and gas, not just uh, on economic grounds, but on 
identity grounds. And, uh, and I think Trudeau and Guibo are, are feeling that uh, right now. So I don't know where, where they're going to go, but I don't think they're going to abandon the oil and gas sector. Uh, I think it's just too, too important. If they want to go back to being a party of two seats, uh, they will do that. Uh, but they are in a governing position. It would be like, you know, the, um, the Ontario Liberals saying, yeah, let's get rid of the car industry in this province. You know, it, it's not going to happen, right? And so um, people may wish that. Um, they may see that the climate is so important that that's a step that needs to be done. But in the real world, that's we're talking what are the steps that way? In micro steps, incremental steps, not complete, keep it in the ground. Yeah. Hi, my name's Leslie Lavers. I have a, a simple question. Do you think that Alberta meets the threshold of a gerrymandered province? No. <laughs> Uh, and there's a lot of things we don't do well in politics in this, prov in, in this province, in this country. Gerrymandering is not one of them. Uh, we can talk on the margins about you know, what went on with Medicine Hat, Cypress Hills, and now Medicine Hat Brooks. We can talk about the issues of, of Airdrie, but we have arm's length boundary commissions that, that do this. Uh, I, there are challenges where you've got ridings in the inner cities that are much bigger than ridings uh, outside, but you can cross um, Calgary Curry where I live, you know, in 10 minutes. Uh, you try going to Lesser Slave Lake, right? Um, don't just pack a lunch, pack a suitcase, right? It's, it's big ridings and those things we need to balance. So. The U.S. has a huge gerrymandering problem. Uh, all you have to do is look at the city of Austin in Texas, which is a pretty liberal city, and yet the Republicans have a majority of the seats because what they do is they pack them all into one inner city Austin seat, and everyone else has, you know, 25% in Austin and 75% outside of Austin. So that's an issue that they have because they don't have boundary commissions. It's settled by the legislature. I don't think we have that issue in Canada. Maureen Hawkins. Um, if some scientists are right, one of the problems we're going to be facing big time is water. And that ties in with energy yeah. because the non-renewable forms of energy don't use water, but all the, I mean, not the non-ones, renewable do. Yeah. Um, how do you think Nentry and the UCP and the NDP will or should handle that, especially if it becomes a bigger and bigger problem and water allocations, fires, et cetera? Water has been a long-standing political battle in this province, particularly uh, south of Calgary. Uh, I've got a book on my shelf that talks about water policy in southern Alberta, where we are right now, and the problems with allocation. Uh, you may recall in the winter, so this would have been February and March, Rebecca Schultz, our environment minister, talking about the potential of drought. Um, and uh, I talked to one of the councillors in Okotoks and they were very concerned about water allocation. And that was before the water main break in Calgary, which didn't just affect Calgary, but affected Airdrie, affected Chestermere, even affected Strathmore. And so water battles will continue. We have lots of water in this province, just not where the people live. Um, there's a lot of water in northern Al Alberta. The, the problem is down in here. And it's not just, uh, the, the book that I've got, uh, it focuses on agriculture in southern Alberta, but it's also part of the energy sector. And so I think water is going to continue to be uh, an issue um, in, this, uh, in this province. Um, and it's going to be a battle between municipalities 
and it's also going to be what is the uh, what is the provincial government going to do uh, about water policy uh, because it is complicated water is so important you don't realize that until they start putting restrictions on you okay and then and, and realizing you know don't flush the toilet don't shower every day you know uh, don't water your lawns use rain barrels you know is that going to be the new the new norm and you combine that with the fear of wildfires thankfully so far knock on wood we haven't seen the big issues of wildfires in this province as we did last year but but I remember sitting there in February and March and listening to Schultz and listening to Todd Lowen talking about droughts and wildfires. Those don't go well together. And so that is going to be a challenge for all parties to deal with, but a much bigger challenge for the government of the day than an opposition party. Because an opposition party, they can criticize. If there's a lack of water, it's easy to criticize. Um, making policy decisions, that's much tougher. And so um, if there's a water shortage, I'd actually rather be Nietzsche than Smith, because Smith is the one that's going to have to deal with it. Okay, we're down to five minutes, Dwayne, so we'll keep these quick. Uh, purple rain, that, that's probably pretty hopeful, especially if you're spelling rain, R-E-I-G-N. Yep. But it, it may fit. We're certainly purple. It's a different color. Yes. Uh, and, and then I've got a written question from Laurie Schultz. It's uh, the influence of the Take Back Alberta Party on Danielle Smith's independence. Uh, you spoke about it once before, about Take Back Alberta and the way they can influence the, the province so far. Um, how is it going right now with Take Back Alberta and their slow infiltration into the province? Yeah. Okay. We'll start with Purple Rain. I've had that suggestion before. Uh, there's a lot to like about that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, the, the problem is the, the purple guy is in opposition. He's not really raining. So, you know, it, it is something to, to think about. Um, and if we're in a drought, I'm not sure our AIN <laughs> works either. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a good idea. Uh, as far as Take Back Alberta, uh, you need to separate, I think, Take Back Alberta as a, as a movement and David Parker as an organizer. Um, he seems to be getting into a lot more trouble. Uh, I'd be very curious to see how much communication Smith has had with him, especially when Parker went really unhinged and was going after Jenny Byrne and Pierre Polyev, um, and, and Smith actually called him out on that. Having said that, there is a noticeable reason, I talked about the trans policies, uh, that they're coming out in November after the AGM. Okay, after the AGM. And um, I think Smith is smart enough to realize the threat to the UCP is always from the right. Uh, ask Jason Kenney that, and um, she, when she was with Wild Rose, she was the threat to the right uh, of Ed Stelmack and uh, Alison uh, Redford. Uh, I don't, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that Take Back Alberta played a role in the trans policies. Uh, this went against everything I understand about Danielle Smith and her social liberalism. Uh, it is very unfortunate. But it may be one of those things where she really ramps stuff up, and then when it comes time for the regulations and the legislation, tones things down again. Um, I will also say that AGM may be interesting. I think Smith will walk through it quite easily. The difference is the people that are opposing her, and it's not going to be the moderates, it's going to be the angry people on the right over things like Bill 20, or over her plan of using the Heritage Trust Fund to put money into oil and gas companies. It's going to come from the right. And even if she gets 85%, 86%, just like Nancy did, the 14% that were against Nancy have been silent. They have been celebrating him and moving on. The 14% that may oppose Smith, they're not going to be quiet about it. And what does media love more? Conflict. And they are going to elevate those 10%, those 14%, and they will find some, some dude uh, who's you know, talking about how Smith has become just like Trudeau or something like that. And that will be the sound bite. Um, so I would not diminish the role of Take Back Alberta. Quite frankly, she would not be premier without Take Back Alberta because they are the ones that drove out Jason Kenney, and that same group of people supported her in the leadership race. Um, but now she's in office. Now she's won an election. Now she doesn't need them as much. 
Um, and and um, this may explain why Parker's going off the rails a bit more. But every once in a while, you see things like that. So in the Bill 20 on municipalities, that's when she threw in the stuff about, we're gonna ban um, ta vote tabulators. Tabulators are not voting machines. They are vote counters, like at a casino or a bank that counts $20 bills. That's all that they do. But she banned that because that was one of the demands um, of, the, uh, of the Take Back Alberta group. Uh, Parker has said, you know, that he made three demands of, of Smith. No more lockdowns uh, and get rid of uh, voting tabulators. Uh, I can't remember what the third one was. But uh, so every once in a while there's a little movement on that. But we, we'll, let's watch to see what happens at the AGM. So Mark Gettle, Mark Gettle is my name. During the campaign, there were lots of policies thrown about, but in my, I, my view, they were all pretty similar. How important do you think it will be for Nenshi to come up with something new, novel, exciting, or just adopt the policies that are already on the table? Will he be looked at as a wimp if he just uses policies that have been uh, proposed by the other candidates? <laughs> The election campaign was quite interesting in, in that respect because I think policies did matter, but that's not what we've seen over the last year. So the single biggest promise that Smith made was a tax cut. Now we can't afford a tax cut. Um, and so even though the price of oil is sitting pretty much where it was when that announcement was made, given that government coffers still look pretty darn good, now all of a sudden we can't afford it. Instead, she goes, well, we're not gonna abandon it, we're gonna delay its implementation. And I started to do the math and the calendar, and it looks like it will come in roughly in the spring of 2027. <laughs> um, and, and, but, so that's one noticeable thing. The other is what the election was not about. Uh, there was no discussion about pensions, in fact, We've got her on record going, nobody is stealing your pension. That's NDP, you know, propaganda. Um, by August, um, there was an attempt to pull out of the pension plan. Uh, there was nothing about the renewables moratorium, even though we now have documents that within days of winning that, they were putting their plan into, into operation. Um, she said, now is not the time to talk about the Sovereignty Act. That was brought in in the, in the fall for the first time. So it was a, there was a lot of activity that occurred this fall, uh, or this spring, with you know, Bills 18 and 20 and 21 and 22, restructuring of AHS, municipal political parties, um, you know, bans on federal cooperation with municipalities, changing the election date, uh, giving more powers to the province over, over um, nat natural disasters. None of that was in the election campaign. It's, it's common that some stuff that campaigned on never actually happens. Um, but this was quite, quite remarkable. And as I mentioned, I think the NDP decision to talk about a corporate tax increase really hurt them. Um, it helped them in 2015, it hurt them in 2023. And so I think policies did matter uh, at, at that election. And I think there are differences between the, the two parties. So last question. Make it easy. <laughs> Hi, Bridget Pasteur. Um, actually, I'm going to try to um, ask for a bit of prophecy here and um, look in the future. With Bill Gates involved with nuclear energy, um, do you foresee that um, Alberta could go nuclear, which would then cut down the oil and gas, or the need for the oil and gas, knowing that nuclear does use a lot of water? It's actually a topic I know something about, so that that was good. Uh, I've done a lot. I, I've done a lot of work on nuclear energy over over the years, and I have no doubt that Alberta is moving towards nuclear energy. Um, you, you see. Uh, 
all sorts of signs of that from the memorandum of understanding that the Kenny government signed with Albert or with Saskatchewan, Ontario, and um, New Brunswick, uh, the cooperation that's going on behind the scenes with the federal government, uh, the Pathways Alliance, the large oil sands companies are all endorsing it. Capital Power, the large electricity producer, has signed an MOU with Ontario Power Generation. Um, so I think it is a serious move. Um, there's still a lot of questions about funding. Um, we will not be the first, Ontario will be the first, but both Saskatchewan and Alberta are following along. And I do this presentation where I compare the last time that nuclear football was kicked around a bit in the province and to today. And I highlight two people who were strongly opposed for different reasons for nuclear back in 2009. One was a backbench NDP uh, member by the name of Rachel Notley, uh, and the other was the leader of the opposition at the time, uh, Daniel Smith. Fast forward to 2023, uh, I don't have quotes from 2024, both of them endorsed the move to small modular reactors in this province. So we're seeing a shift in this province at industry level, we're seeing a shift in public opinion, we're seeing a shift across the country, hence Ontario, New Brunswick, um, Saskatchewan and the Trudeau government, and we're seeing a switch amongst uh, the political elite. So I have no doubt that that's going to occur, but that's not something that's going to happen in the next two years. And I would be surprised if Nancy um, came out in opposition to it. I mean, if, if Notley can come out in support of it, uh, I think Nancy will a as well. Um, so yeah, I do think there will be nuclear energy in this province, um, but it'll be sometime in the 2030s.